Makamba Online is a Pan-African digital platform um, where we talk about all things entrepreneurship. So we believe Africa is fabulous, um, bursting with opportunities, and there's a lot of things that we can do as a people. However, entrepreneurship has not grown as fast as it should on the continent, and that's the reason why we're here. Silent would be good because then you can tweet and hashtag AEE, Africa Entrepreneurship Exchange. Um, there's a bunch of reasons why people say entrepreneurship hasn't grown. People say it's access to funding. Other people say it's because we don't have an entrepreneurial culture. And that's the reason why we're sitting here with five fabulous entrepreneurs who are going to tell us from their personal experience what the experience has been in entrepreneurship and their personal story. So in Zimbabwe, there's only one uh, TV channel. And uh, to be politically correct, it's pretty backward. And they have a lot of you know, funding issues. So it's very difficult to wait for them to sort of open up the airwaves and get us young progressive people on because they just don't have the money. And I guess the mentality is different. So I said to myself, well, I'm not going to wait for digitization to happen because this is around the period when analog was about to get switched over to digital. Um, I'm going to shoot a show in a living room. So I decided to save money uh, for about three or four months from my paycheck. And we shot tonight with Zororo in the living room, a very cramped space. Um, and then I used that pilot and I went to different uh, corporate sponsors and I said, hey, if, if we can produce a 13 episode show like this, would you want to back it? Are you happy with the quality, the style? Um, you know, could you put your brand towards it? Because obviously the TV station wasn't going to give us money, and that's usually the traditional model. Um, they did, and I went on to produce 13 episodes. Um, and it recently won a NAMA Award, a National Arts Merit Award, for the best TV show in Zimbabwe. So, um, and now we're, we're trying to figure out what to do for season two and beyond, but that's, that's my journey in brief. Hello, everybody. I'm Sophie Ndaba. Um, my journey started quite early. <laughs> it started probably when I was 14 or 15. I lived with an amazing family that fostered me, that taught me business in the sense that, I mean, I always say to people when they are starting out, they always say, oh, my background is so sad and it's so bad. And, and I always say, what, do you, what good do you find in that bad that you call bad? And for me, there was never any bad, I think. I was taught how to be an entrepreneur, you know, um, at a very tender age. And um, it was really working in, 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 in a family ho a business where there was a butchery. There was, you know, things that you wouldn't really pay attention to. There was a butchery. There was a grocery shop. There was a bottle store. There was a, a florist. There was everything. And for me as a young person, I just wanted to go to school. I wanted to be able to pay for my school fees. And... Um, Every weekend, Friday, Saturday, I would work there and be able to pay for my school fees and have pocket money. And when I turned, I think, 16 or 17, I, I had a daughter. And I had to obviously then think about my family and think about as a young teenager who's brought a baby home, what do I do to change my life? And I thought the only thing I can do now, I can't go to varsity, let me be that entrepreneur because I remember that I know business. I know, I know it from age 14. Nobody can touch me that I was convinced. And I went on to say, okay, what's the easiest thing to do? And I thought, modeling is easy. Let me go and stand in front of a camera <laughs> and model because I think I can speak for myself and I think I can smile and I think they'll buy into it. And they did buy into it. I joined a modeling agency. I became a model. But that was boring for me because I was used to action from a very young age. I was used to making things happen, making money. That wasn't mine, but I was used to making money. And I thought, let me turn this around. And I then opened a catering company of my own. I knew how to cook from a very young age. So I opened a catering company, which I used to cook from my own kitchen, from my home. I think I got a townhouse and I used to cook from my four plate stove and cook for four or five hundred people. You know, get a team of people to work with me, turn my garage into a storeroom, into a kitchen. And it really worked out because that was the launch of me in business. And, you know, I was doing it with my hands and I was cooking in a three-foot pot and people wouldn't link me with that. They'd think, oh, no, she's a model. She's too fabulous for a three-foot pot. But that's where it starts. That's the foundation. And I think a lot of people are too afraid of starting at the very bottom to get to the top because they think, what will people think? I took that out of my head and I thought, when you want to be a successful business person, the foundation is key. And what people think doesn't matter and it shouldn't matter because it's all about you and your target and where you're going. 
And after that, I thought, okay, now that I've done catering, what else can I do? And I thought, I want to now manage the caterers. And then I said, right, I'm opening an events company where I'm going to subcontract it because now I know exactly what I want to achieve. And I got a lot of caterers under my books, and I started delegating and saying, you do that project, you do that project. Let me see the quality. I want to do food tasting. Because now I was at a level where I knew everything, and I didn't study to be a chef. I trained myself through research on the Internet, through watching cooking shows, through practicing, through through implementing. My, my clients were like um, MTN, there were Nike South Africa, there were Brand Water, there were Mahali's Water. They were top companies that really entrusted me with you know, uh, delivering catering and food uh, for all their workshops and gala dinners. And then I went on a step further as an entrepreneur and I said, I need to now launch my own events company and start you know, providing a full-on service, and that's where now I do RSVP, I do planning of weddings globally. I mean, I've done weddings in Dubai, I've done weddings in New York, I've done weddings in the whole of Africa, actually. Harare, Harare yes, <coughs> my home, <laughs> where I grew up, and I learned all of this. That's the foundation of who I am. That's like my home. And 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 um, uh, the interesting thing that I need to share with you is that from the butchery where I learned about hind court and leg court and cutting the meat and everything that people are so afraid of, they like don't link it with women. It's like, oh, why would you talk to me about meat? You know, I then, when I was still a model at G3, before I started my business, I thought I need more money. I need to make money. I need to survive, you know, because I was, I was a breadwinner at 17 at home. I was taking care of my whole family. And my baby, of course. And I thought, okay, I'm going to go to this credit control department. There's 300 women in here. They like this overtime thing, so I'm going to target them and say, I'll buy the meat for you. So I went and I did a deal with the butchery close by, halal, all the way. And I said, I will order. You're not going to charge me 18 rand 99 per kilogram. You're going to charge me 14 because I know at the other markets, at the abattoir, you get it for 10. So let's not get confused. I'll support you every month. <laughs> so I already knew that whole strategy from age 14, 15, how it all operates. So people started ordering, and every month I would make 10 times more what I was earning as a salary from that because I had orders every month delivered to people on their desk. And I would, I would name it, I would label it, because I just thought it's fun. And I would label it and have a cooler box delivered and branded with my name, and it was the most exciting thing ever as a young person to do. And, and um, that's when then I, I just decided that now I want to go into production, and that's when I went to television, and, and the rest is history, really. I just think that people should not be afraid of where they started and where they, you know, they came from. And no matter how weird it looks, try and find what you can use from that weirdness. My name is Nawal Nolwazindluli. I will say this. I am a woman. I am black, African, and I am an entrepreneur. How it all started? I'm very close to my dad. I'm a firstborn child. And the connection between myself and my dad, it's, you can't separate the two of us. He bought me a toy. Typical black family. You, can, you know exactly what I'm talking about. This big doll, plastic doll, no hair. I think it was probably one of the cheapest because the one with hair are slightly expensive but I was blessed with a doll with no hair, just bold, and um, I just couldn't connect with it. Um, all what I used to do is that when I have my crowd of my siblings, because I'm a firstborn child and our neighbors coming to play with us because we're not allowed to go and play next door, so the world will come to us, I will actually rent out my doll. You want to be the mommy? I will actually sort of like, you come, you rent the baby for you too. <laughs> So um, the whole issue of money um, started at a very a tender age. Probably that time I was at the age of two, three, four, five, and um, I would rent out the doll. Uh, they wouldn't actually have money, but I was very clear. I wanted very clear stones. If you want to have, go pick up those clear stones, and remember they're very scarce. Go pick up the clear stones, wash it, and then give them. Then I'll do sort of like change, but I'll try, try and get a box, you know, of Coca-Cola or, you know, the, the crate. Yeah, yes. Crate. You get the crate, and I'll actually be this side. But the counter thing for me was very important, not knowing that 
there is this business thing in myself. It's only now when I'm actually big, then I look back and I think, oh, it was actually there. That's actually how it started. Then I got to sub A that time, not too, please don't think I'm too old, no. <laughs> but it was sub A, so you'll understand for those who are actually at my age will understand it was, now? now it's grade one. Wow, okay. According to grade one, I'm a December child. So by the time when I started, I was actually still five, you know, um, about 10, 10, early, late uh, in the year. So I was much more of the youngest, but with a bigger structure, as you can see, uh, blessed with the bigger bones. But um, I got there and I said to my dad, you're going to take me with uh, this weekend. And my dad said, okay, no, it's fine. Where are we going? You're going to town. So my parents used to go to town every weekend. But this time around, they had to go to a wholesaler. I saw a packet of the chocolate, Cadbury, Ecclesia. You probably remember them. Um, and I said to my dad, please, just buy me this packet. They are 144 in a packet, and they were 7 rand 15 cent a packet. He bought me that packet. If you don't believe, go to my Facebook. You will just see even people today. I posted yesterday deliberately because of this, and they said, we still remember. People that I went to school with, they said, we remember. I was the first at my primary school to sell sweets. Uh, one week later, they actually called my parents to say, the school, it's a mess because of me. Then I said, okay, boys and girls, let's agree. Let's pick up all the papers. Let's now knit, because remember, inside, it's silverish. Then we started actually doing some belts. Boys and girls will collect the papers. They buy. Then I help them how to now do nice silver belts, you know, for both boys and girls. So it will actually be like a joint collection. Little did I know still at the time that there is this business thing in me. Um, I never look back. With my dad, seven rand for 15 cents, he got paid his money. And it's like, you can call my dad now. I don't owe him. I paid his money, seven rand 15 cents with no interest, within a week. I never stopped from that day the whole retail. It just continued. I went to boarding school. There were no popcorns. I just said, oh, it's very dead. A tuck shop closed exactly at 5 o'clock. What do we do? By the time when we go to um, studies, nothing. Then I brought popcorns, you know, the cheese popcorns and the colorful ones, packeted it and started selling it. So the whole business was so much in me. Got into a high school, it was just the same. My first big business where now I had to pay rent was a saloon. Then I ended up with about six salons around the country. And from there, then I said, okay, what do else do I do? But one thing that I never forgot, it's to make sure that I bring women in my whole journey. Even today, if you go and ask all the salons the way I owned, I handed over to some of the women that I started with. From there, then I graduated. You get much more smarter and look at more exciting and, you know, lucrative businesses, but you've got actually to start at that, you know, uh, you, you know a, a smaller, as, 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 um, as Sophie uh, said earlier on. And then from there, then I'm much more now uh, diverse. I traveled. I lived in the U.K. I was the first, you know, South African, you know, uh, black woman to be appointed by the South African tourism. It opened my eyes. But even that time, I am out of the country, living out of the country, but I never stopped operating like a business person. I looked at opportunity. I said, I would love to be in mining. How do I get into mining? I would love to be in media and publishing. How do I get it right? And today, I will actually sort of like say, I am one of maybe the very few black media-owned company, which is women, black women-owned businesses with no support from any big brother, started from scratch, no funding, Absolutely nothing. If you ask about every little thing, I run, if they say tea, I run to the kitchen to make the tea. And we grew together with the team. And I said, what else should I actually sort of like leverage on here? Then I said, well, I will take actually advantage of the printing. How do I get into printing? Because now I'm in the, uh, in the, in the, media, I mean, in the media space, understanding publishing. Three magazines, you know, within a year, uh, within an eight-year period, which is Mamas and Papas. It's one of our publications, which was born eight years ago. Then from there, followed by Essays of Africa, followed by African Travel Market. So that's actually how we grow. But with a very clear mind that we want to diversify. Diversification is important. And when you start with one, you get scared to say, mm, maybe I shouldn't. Then we said, well, there are opportunities in oil. How about tapping into oil space as well? So then now you start saying, 
there are opportunities there, there are opportunities, there are opportunities, then you get into that space. But the key thing is just being staying focused and saying, I want to grow a business. And how do you now tap into the entire, because if you look at my journey, it talks to Africa. It doesn't just talk to South Africa. That's actually where I pitched it. Talks to South Africa and how do I ensure that women are empowered in a journey, the journey of business, you know, with women. I think basically that's actually where I can say we're sitting today. What inspired me to work for myself was my father. So our father retired. He was a civil servant. And with his retirement, he bought a small tractor, power paraffin driven, you know, little tractors and a grinding mill, okay? But you must remember this is way back in the 50s. I mean, these were the rich guys. <laughs> I was just, you know, whispering that this gentleman you see here, his father, Paul Matambanadzo, operated the largest passenger fleet, a bus passenger fleet in uh, Malawi, Zimbabwe, and Botswana. Those are the three countries, right? But, I mean, the difference, my father was just, it's like a tech shop operator. So one day, he took me along, put me on his lap, and said, I'm going to go with you to Bindura to buy power paraffin. So I sat on his lap, and he says, okay, wrap your, your little palms around the steering wheel. I'm sure some of you have had that experience with your parents, you know. And as he drove, you know, I also pretended to be driving. This was really exciting, you know, and I felt uplifted and so on. And then so we came back, and I observed that um, the headman, so in a, in a communal land setting, a makaya, you have the, you have the headman, then you have the chief. Yeah. That the chiefs would, the headman would come to, to my old man to ask him to plow their fields and they would bring their grain, you know, for grinding. And the old man would say, oh no, for the headman, don't charge anything. And occasionally the chief himself would come, you know. And I observed how he treated the chiefs and how receptive he was and he went out of the way to look after them and so on. And he always had money because people were paying cash, you know. And with the tractor he did contract plowing. He plowed for fellow villagers, you know, demonstrators, teachers and so on. So again they paid in cash, he always had money. And I was always fascinated to see people come to my old man and borrow money, you know headmaster, a teacher, um, what were they called, madumeni, the um, agricultural, what, uh, assistants, and so on. And I sit there and say, oh, my father is loaning money to all these people. These are the people who run society, you know. So I think my idea of uh, wanting for self-sufficiency came from there. I said, when I grow up, I want to be you know, like my father, I must always have money. I must always be the one if in the community to help. I think that's the philanthropy bit. And um, that I mustn't go to anyone for money. I must always have my own money. People should come to me instead. So that's where, that's where the spirit came from. Then I wanted to... I, I was accepted in America to go and do a degree in, in communications. That's radio and television, not telecommunications, or the one you are doing. Zororo didn't tell you that he's doing a master's in what? Uh, producing. In producing. producing. What's your school called? New York Film Academy. Film Academy in Hollywood. I wanted to go and do the radio and television. Then the old man died, and I couldn't go. So I said, what is the nearest thing I can do, you know, to to communications. I said radio. So that's how my, you know, radio life, you know, started with the then Rhodesia Broadcasting Corporation. But I wanted to become a commercial, you know, broadcaster. I didn't want to read the news, you know, and get stuck in all that propaganda <coughs> that Ian Smith, you know, was waging, you know, to the nation. So I set up a company and went around looking for, for clients, and I would go to the then, uh, which is now ZBC, and um, rent studio time. So the client is mine. I would go rent studio time. 
record my program, pay for the airtime, and pocket the difference. So 15 years later, we bought out the largest production company. It was a combination of advertising promotions and commercial radio and television. And we, necked, we named, renamed it Media Associates. And I was the CEO and chairman of the board. And from there, I went into many things that you have read about. Retail trading, distribution, what is Zororo? <laughs> Joy TV. <laughs> Joy TV. Yes. There is the microphone. Are we, we, you do one, I do one? Yes. Okay, Joy TV, which was the first private-owned station in Zimbabwe. Yes. Your turn. Africa Royal, which imported Carefree Care products from Atlanta and Stay Sofro for distribution in Southern Africa. So that's similarities with Pearl. Yeah, with your business, yes. Um, old Mutual. Old Mutual, yes. So in the insurance industry, there is something they call the million dollar round table. If you do exceedingly well, you qualify in two years. I qualified in eight months. So you are trained to work in the upper market, sell insurance products to people like you. Only because when you sign up for a policy, you realize the importance of it. If you go and write nurses and soldiers, people who live in a group are the most dangerous. When one cancels, everybody does, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> no nurses in the room and no insult. <laughs> so we were trained to work in the upper market. You write the business people, you know, ministers, decision makers, and professionals. Next. Uh, to touch on Lonro more. Yes, Lonro, yes. Yes. Um, maybe you experienced it with Boeing. So Lonro had, had a franchise to sell Lonro, sorry, Boeing aircraft aeroplanes in Africa. And I was given the responsibility to sell aeroplanes in the SADAC and PTA region. You know what SADAC is? You know what? Anyone knows what SADAC is? David? Southern African Development. Ah, Mulungu. You, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I got you. <laughs> it's in space, yeah. So, you know, we used to take ministers of aviation, presidents, prime ministers on demonstration flights, you know, to Seattle. And I must have met then about 16 prime ministers of all heads of states, including our own. He was prime minister then, before he became president. Um, His Excellency. Huh? How do you say it properly? And Commander-in-Chief, <laughs> Robert, President Robert Mugabe. I had the honor to fly him. Uh, he's part of his cabinet and his staff. I think there were 44 to Seattle in Washington State. And Boeing put on a first-class demonstration, and that's how the 2767s and the 737s prior to that, you know, were, were acquired. So that was the Lonro experience. Next. I think let's move on to Telesel in the interest of time. Telesel. I was very curious to know what people think of me. So um, I contacted a number of people and say, can you please just write something, a short statement about me, how you perceive me? So I have this. I hope to read it in between and share it with you. Okay. Thank you. Right. So because we are, as you see, business be heard, Africa be heard, our hashtag is Africa be heard, um, I'd like to go back to our panelists and ask them, what do they think of the future of entrepreneurship in Africa? But before I start, I'd like to pay the bills. Um, for every event, there are sponsors. So uh, one of our sponsors, um, Essays of Africa, I think all of you have been given one, and um, Africa Travel Market, it's ATM who are owned by Quinta Media, the chief executive of whom is here. So we'd like to say thank you to her. Right, our second sponsor is not here, but you can see all that lovely bubbly sitting there, um, Gray and Beck Wines. Please can we just lift one up to show to everybody? So this is another of our sponsors. <laughs> Right, the future of entrepreneurship in Africa. Um, I do not have the time, but can I give you three minutes? In the interest of, the, you know, just kind of 
everybody getting to maybe understand my journey a little bit better. Um, I wanted to be a vet growing up. I wanted to work as a wildlife um, vet specifically. I wanted to tend. So when all my friends were watching cartoons, I was watching uh, SAPC3. Like my dad would be like, this is, and I loved school. So my dad loved that about me. To this day, just because I liked school, I think I'm his favorite kid, but don't tell my sisters. So um, he also bought me, and this is something I, I, I tell not very often. Um, because I loved animals, I couldn't sell my chicken. But because now I love, <laughs> I had these chicken. So I used to catch pigeons with the boys. I was a tomboy. So I used to catch pigeons all the time. And what happened was my dad felt so bad for these pigeons because at the time I didn't understand the feelings they had, as it were. I didn't understand that it was wrong. For me, it was just so cool to have pigeons and I wanted to take care of them and love them, etc. So he got me chicken. He got me four, then he got me two more because he wanted different colors. It's a big thing in KZN, which color the chicken is before you slaughter it for whatever purpose. Um, in six months, there were 60. I used to, in summer, take them away from the mother after like two weeks because then the hawks would come and then there'd be two chicks out of 12 left. So we, I would hand rear them myself. The chicken in the morning would follow me up to the bus stop because they wanted food. I thought it was because they liked me, but they just wanted food. Um... And what happened was, you know, we wanted to sell them. Sometimes my dad would sell them, and I would watch how that transaction would go. And to a point where my love for animals kind of fed my family, um, but I, had, I didn't have a business sense at the time. It kind of fed my family at the time where I realized it was a good thing to actually slaughter them, even though it was very painful for me at the beginning because I'd named them and everything, all like, well, maybe the top ten favorites. Um, and about 20 chicken a month, you know, would be taken in. So we didn't have to buy chicken. And for my family, that was a huge relief, you know, um, of my parents' wallet. So there was that. Then I was like, okay, cool. My dad was the head of the stock fell. When he decided to remove himself, the whole stock fell fell apart because nobody, uh, they didn't trust anybody else to take care of their money in the way that my father would. So I then decided, oh, okay, so you need to be trustworthy with money. That's what I learned from that. What was cool about my school was that at some point they started allowing kids to be entrepreneurs. So at one particular quad, there would be sales. So you'd get to the table. I think at the time it was who got there first until you were quite a regular where you couldn't move that person because people were actually going to get upset with you. There was this one girl who sold fudge, and that fudge was amazing. I didn't even bother trying to make fudge. Um, so I made popcorn and I made muffins and I'd sell out sometimes even before break time because kids would buy them in the morning before they'd be finished or keep it for lunch so that they didn't have to rush for lunch time. And then my mother started asking me for the money bag or like <laughs> making me pay for the stove and stuff. Or like, then I was like, this is not becoming very viable for me because then I'll have to charge them more. And the other girl charges one rand. Her parents don't make her pay. The competition's too stiff. Let me figure something else out. So I started modeling as well. Um, but unfortunately, soon after that, my mother died, and it wasn't just a pastime anymore. I had to do it to help s support and sustain the family. Because um, after about 18 years old, all I got from my dad was money to take the taxi to a point where I didn't get the money, and sometimes I'd give it to my sister, and I bought my own matric dance dress, etc. So there's kind of been that fostering. My mother was very hardworking, but there was no entrepreneurial spirit in my family and to this day I kind of wish that there was the only thing we had was the stock fell and the things that I did um, and then I got to um, start acting I wanted to act because I wanted to do evil stuff and not go to jail so I loved Sherelle <laughs> from Isidingo um, and I ended up working there I, I, I was loving zone 14 at the time also because of the bad people because I could never be like that so I thought, wow, so if in order to do bad stuff and get paid for it and get awards for it, you need to act. So then I wanted to act. I joined drama at school, and I, beca I became an actress. I've been nominated for one SAFTA. I've done a movie recently for um, in tribute of the life of Solomon Matlangu that some of us will know. Entrepreneurship is like the economic soul of a country or of an economy. So... You need those private sectors. You need people who are interested in creating work for other people, for a country and for a society to function, which is very important. But what I find is happening for me is that we have to remind ourselves to work with other black entrepreneurs. Um, otherwise, we're all not going to grow. I find that a lot of the time, the black man and woman 
we don't we all want to be at the top that we're not willing to take other people up with us i'm too young to know this that means it's real and i hope that i can be one of the people who change that but that's going to mean in terms of you know the entrepreneurship ecosystem we need to support each other a lot more we need to believe in each other a lot more we need to mentor each other a lot more instead of just giving up on somebody because maybe they're unreliable or they know they don't know as much as you would like them to know um i feel the young people right now i i touched on this a little bit earlier um we you know they have this new culture called slashies like people who i'm a businesswoman slash actress slash developer slash 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 like we don't want to focus on one thing which is okay if you can handle everything but we've got to learn to work together we've got to learn to not want to be the only one who's winning and that's i think is what's holding us behind as africans this is why africa needs to take charge of its own future and entrepreneurs are pivotal for that we can't do it without entrepreneurs people who are forward thinking people who are willing to work hard people who are willing to start from the bottom in order to make sure that we succeed as a nation we decided to change things up first of all we've got a list of questions that came from our online audience that we need to go through but there was an issue that i raised or a discussion point that i raised are entrepreneurs born or made and i'd like to ask one of our audience members to answer that mr paris please first let me start by congratulating the the panelists <clears throat> i i I've, you know through my career from being a banker to management consultant and running my own businesses i've always had great admiration for entrepreneurs i'm not an entrepreneur i am a very boring guy who can run stuff and make things happen but i'm not the person who sits at 2 o'clock in the morning and comes up with a great idea which no one wants to do and which seems totally off the wall and then goes out and does it. So I got total admiration <coughs> for you guys. You know, the issue of whether or not entrepreneurs are made or, or born or they made is one which um, in academia we debate lots, lots and lots. And, and I lecture, I ran the Center for Entrepreneurship at Gibson Fitz for a long while and it's a question every year that comes up. Now, I have a very specific answer and <coughs> I'd probably like some other views on it. That there's, there's a notion of entrepreneurs being socialized and, and that really is a combination of being born into certain circumstances and then having a set of experiences which allow them to foster. Now, <coughs> you gave a really interesting chat and talked about Jews and Indians, etc. Well, part of what makes those communities very uh, prolific in producing entrepreneurs it's because people are born into a, to a, a state of challenge they are already told that there you know there's almost an existential challenge they have to go out and do stuff but that's not sufficient to become an entrepreneur because becoming an entrepreneur involves taking calculated risk and to take calculated risk you have to have the confidence um and lots of that confidence usually comes from coming from a environment which no which where you know if you fail you're going to still be able to get up and go again so which is why a lot of poor people don't become entrepreneurs okay they 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 become survivalists spaza shops etc but you don't do what sophie and dab is doing if you haven't got some support behind you both materially and in terms of family supports one of the other important things <coughs> about being an entrepreneur is that <laughs> you have to be comfortable with failure you know and and a lot of us are too insecure to to even countenance failure which is why we want the paycheck and there's nothing wrong with with wanting the paycheck 99.9% of the world you know of us are going to be paycheck bunnies it's very few people who become successful entrepreneurs the other um <coughs> The other issue I wanted to talk about is oh entrepreneurs generally start early. And they start early because they generally are in an environment where they see other entrepreneurs and then James you talked about you know about your dad etc. So MC whether or not entrepreneurs are, are born or made I'm afraid it's a, it's a little bit of both and and it's really about a, an environment which socializes people into becoming entrepreneurial and being comfortable. I'm now going to go on to the questions that we got from our online audience. Um unless my panelists will promise me they will do like a very short I think what I would want to point out and I've had, you know, the 
the awesome privilege of being exposed and well traveled is that a lot of the underdevelopment in Africa, there's just, when you look at it in that regard, there's a lot of opportunity. And you find, um, as was just mentioned, that some people are happy just to stick to an eight to five and there's nothing wrong with that. But if you have sort of this desire to be challenged and to want to solve an obvious solution and you've had the opportunity of seeing different markets and different cultures and different countries, there's a lot that we can still do here on the African market. And a lot of what we see around us are just uh, minimis. They're copycats. They're just tailored towards your specific need and want. It may be cultural. It may be um, a different color. But everything that's around us is nothing new under the sun. So I think in that regard, we have a lot of development that we can do. And with the you know advance of technology and the internet, there's a lot that us young people, especially you know our generation, um, can really do to sort of develop and sort of bring things up to where they should be or in comparisons to um, other countries around the world. I will say we, we need to be a very a careful maybe before we seriously engage on that um, because the reality is that we do need entrepreneurs and there are thousands of entrepreneurs in Africa but are we all going to be entrepreneurs? And I know that immediately when we start having this conversation, then it's like, uh -oh, so what are you saying? There are opportunities in Africa, thousands of opportunities in Africa, but that doesn't mean that we need to, all of us will have to be entrepreneurs. We need to say, where are the opportunities who can actually take advantage of the opportunities and really lead? Remember, as much as I am an entrepreneur, I am a provider of close to 100 or 20 or 50 people that I need to take care of. I will still need that support. As much as I will say, yes, every person should be an entrepreneur. So we shouldn't actually sort of like just you know, have a conclusion that says, no, we need to be, we not, not all of us are going to be, to be entrepreneurs, but we need to be smart enough. And we need to say, yes, there are opportunities in, 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 in Africa, but how do we stand up and be this Russian doll? I think um, one of the speaker, I mean, uh, one of the uh, 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 gentlemen at the back there mentioned something that we've got actually to be ready to fall. But it's not every business person that is actually really ready to fall. And it's not actually every business person in Africa that is actually really to take that, uh, you know, that, that, that opportunity or, or that to, to, to really leverage on that. It's not something that it's so cool. But we need to have a, this at the back of our mind and say, how do we become this uh, Russian doll? A Russian doll, you push it and then it springs back to where it's supposed to be and it takes the right direction. But you've got to understand that there are thousands of hardships. It's closer to the end of the month. And you must actually know that that's actually a main worry of every entrepreneur. We're going on uh, through a critical, uh, I mean, a critical, uh, you know, economic challenge now. Then you think, am I going to fire half of all these people? How do I now diversify? And that's actually a big challenge that we need to say, moving forward, how do we take advantage of that? Or how do we deal with those uh, kind of opportunity? I mean, uh, of, of of challenges that we face with. I just want to just add on um, fostering entrepreneurship on the continent is, you know, I think I also want to add on to what Pearl said about how we perceive Uguti Indians is how they operate, uses how we operate. I've always thought they were just born blessed, and I don't think they really worked. That's my perception. Um, but I just think that if us as Africans, I mean, South Africans are so fortunate that a lot of, you know, opportunities are there, government funds a lot of businesses and they're there to support. And when you look at other countries that are just next door to us, Abu Swaziland, Abu Zimbabwe, Abu Zambia, and you think, how do we create partnerships? And I think that's where it really starts. Simple things. Um, franchises, you know, uh, you have a hair salon, you have a beauty store, you have a supermarket, you have all these big companies, KFC, etc., coming into Africa and and taking over and to get a franchise of KFC you have to qualify to have a certain amount of money in your bank account to qualify to have a franchise of KFC why are we told we cannot make our own chicken why can we 
not make a chicken better than KFC. And Africans, the people themselves, believe in it. And it's not with us as business people buying into that franchise and saying, Tina, as Africans, we are not going to buy into KFC anymore. We're going to buy into dash, dash, dash chickens because we believe in it. And we believe as Africans, this is how we grew up eating chicken. Why are we being educated on how we should eat chicken. So I just think that it starts with the small things. I mean, we can go into mining and say, let's create partnerships, let's buy shares there and there. That's higher level. We have to start at the foundation where we are creating employment and we know that we are sharing. We're sharing ideas amongst us. I mean, a few years ago when I was still, I'm still acting, of course, but <laughs> when I was still with one of the biggest shows in Africa, Generations, and we went to Zambia and we went to do exchange and we wanted to exchange with the producers and the writers and the directors. And I had experience in directing, I had experience in producing, but I was known as an actor, but because this was a country that didn't really have much, so we had to impart that knowledge. So it just starts with the small things. And if we don't start now, how do we really hope to get there? When I look at you, uh, Zoro, with your uh, producing, I, I, I wouldn't want to just see you going to New York, getting that degree and, and, and starting your own film company in the U.S. and only Zimbabwe. I would love to see you saying, right, where are the producers at? Where are the young people who want to go into this industry? And then we impart that. I think 10 years from now, we'll see a different, a different kind of ambience when it comes to business and growth in Africa. If I may, just to pick up on what um, you know, uh, Sophie touched on, it's Africa is a gold. There is no gold in Africa, but we, Africa is a gold. The globe currently is looking at us very closely. That's why they come and take advantage. If you look at all these big brands that are coming into Africa, you just look, for example, remember when you see South Africa will still be the entry point to get into Africa? You look at all these big brands, you name them. They are coming through South Africa, and immediately when they touch the ground of South Africa, you've got to know that they are just not in South Africa. They are in Africa because they have realized that Africa is the goal, and they've realized that the, the fact that as Africans, we're still not together when it comes to business. We're still so fragmented. I wouldn't actually want to partnership because it's going to be like, so which name are we going to use? Makamba? No, what about my name? Because I, I told you. So are you going to be the, my boss? It's not going to work like that. And, and it's actually a big, it's a big challenge that we're faced with. Um, uh, if there is Essays of, of, of Africa magazine, which is targeted to a black African woman that portrays this woman as the queen and tells a different story. No, who is she? I don't know her. I've never even read about her. No, I'd rather go get Vogue. That's actually the, 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 the sad part of our mentality. You look at all, you know, within the magazine space, you look at all the big, the big magazines in Africa, in South Africa, that are selling most are international magazines. There's no local magazine that is actually on top. And who's buying that? Go check the numbers. 80% of the people that are buying those magazines are actually us. But we don't believe in our own. So we, it, it really needs to start with us. We'd rather have a condenast coming overseas to come and tell a story about Africa and not buying or believing in African travel market that tells a different story that is actually not sort of like sugar-coated or that always when you talk about Africa, it portrays poverty and a child with a nose strip and stuff, you know, and, um, you know, cow dung and, you know, uh, dust and everything. Something that is contemporary because that's actually not only Africa. Hence, I've said all the products that we do, the stuff that we, we need to think about the continent, it's not a conversation about South Africa. It's not a conversation about Zimbabwe. It's not a conversation about Nigeria. It's, a, it's, an, African, it's an African conversation. Business should be an African business. When you start something small, think about the continent. When you think of uh, manufacturing linen, think about the continent to say, am I representing the continent so that when I stand up, I say, this is a product from the continent. You look at China, how they operate, for an example. They sort of like... It's, it's not south of China or north of China. It's China. And that's actually not being, uh, you know, a shy away from it. So with us, we still, it's going to take us probably another 100 years until we sort out our differences and start operate, 
move away from the silo kind of operation and say, how do we unite? How do we believe in our own brands and really embrace and truly embrace it and support each other? I'm, I'm going to add. I was on the cover of True Love last month. <laughs> I was on the I was on the cover of True Love last month, and in I live, you know, Santon. So my cover was at the bottom. All the white covers at the top. Now I don't mess around. My cover's gonna sell. I took my cover. I moved this little white lady, and I put all the copies there. Took two, went and paid. We've got to do the little things. And I questioned one of the managers and I said, why are all the black people magazines at the bottom, sir? How are we supposed to find them? He was like, oh, I never realized. I was like, yeah, I know it's a white area and I know why people won't buy drum in your eyes. But I exist here. Please acknowledge me. Yes. I, I yeah. just yeah. yeah. question, okay. You know, there's a pop star who died two months ago, David Bowie. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you watch his interview. But if you go to YouTube, you can watch this interview. Yeah. It was being interviewed by um, MTV in the 80s. So he said to the other person, why is it that you don't show, why is it that you, can you hear me now? Yes. So I was talking about David Bowie, who died uh, some two months ago, pop star. Um, and in the 80s, he was being interviewed by MTV. So he says to, to, to the presenter, why is it that you don't show black black um, uh, video uh, video shows and the guy says yeah we do David Bowie said yes at 2 in the morning That's, it reminds me of what you just said he said yes it says who is watching television at 2 in the morning mm -hmm. and him and other pro you know black activists waged their campaign you know with uh, MTV and then slowly from 2 it was 11 and then mainstream <laughs> so that, that is very important those are the small things which, but really are the big things. Mm. I don't know if you've seen, because I was like this until consciousness and Steve Biko arose within me. We like to be close to white people because we feel better than where we're from when we're there. And it was, it's only now that I'm like, hold on. But even if my neighbor's white, the way I grew up means I can still go and greet them and create and form some sort of relationship or at least know the name. And I lived with this very old, lovely white couple. The lady's name is Cherry, the husband is Peter, and they've got lovely dogs. One is Benjamin, the other one died. So we have to make that effort, and we need to learn to, to, to foster that spirit. Just because we're in this area, and this is how people act in this area, and we aspire to that very high-class European life, we've lost our roots, and it's our fault. We're too much in the clouds. Our roots are dying down there. So we need to grow and need to remember where we're from and why we are Africans, because we're never going to be Europeans. until. So Europeans live in those houses like that. I know all my neighbors back home. Why don't I know them in Santon? It's because I got too excited, and I need to change that. I think, could I answer that? Um, as a, I think I'm exposed to a lot of young people who aspire to be event planners or aspire to be in the business that I'm in because I also have a company where we do interior deco and we do people's homes. And they look and they say, okay, I want to start this business. Where do I get the money from, et cetera, et cetera. And I think 
funding, understanding funding, understanding um, you registering your company, understanding that you need an accountant. And I think that's the foundation that a lot of young people lack. I mean, you look at National Youth Development Agency of South Africa, I've spoken to the deputy chair and said to him, why is it that you're not doing programs where young people who want to be entrepreneurs understand the foundation? Because once you've got the foundation in your hands, you're able to function and understand that the challenges up there come because this happened, come because that happened. You need a capital amount. People get tenders. They get small tenders. And they struggle a lot because the first thing they see, three million. Oh, I got a three million tender. The first thing they do is buy a new car mm -hmm. because they don't understand that that money is not yours. It's mm -hmm. to run the business. And then you assess, did I make a profit? And if that profit was 20% of the three million, you know you've got huh, maybe 600, 300,000, you're not sure. But that's to reinvest into the business. So they're not taught the system of reinvesting in order for the business to grow. And you take a little piece of the pie, 2%, because you know that once you've grown and you've added and you've added, five years from now you're going to see the growth. And I think that's where it needs to start. The foundation is where we are having a problem in this country. The youth of this country are jumping straight into business. They do make it well because they've got fantastic ideas, but it falls flat because they don't know how to manage. I think when we do face these challenges, character and resolve is very, very important. And I think everyone here in this room, you know, growing up, you had about five friends. And you'd all sit down, whether having a drink or you were having a smoke or, you know, during a game or you had a party. <laughs> and, um, you know, the smoker section, that's where it's like the water cooler. That's where everyone really gets to talking. And people say, you know, when I'm 25, I want a Range Rover. I want to be the next manager for Liverpool. I want to run Lacoste. You know, we had all these these dreams. And I want to mention one thing, just, and it's a quote, and I don't know who to attribute it to, I forgot, but just waking up, they say, is just 95 or 90% of, you know, getting the stuff done, just waking up and actually doing it. And I think our dreams are very, um, they scare people because you actually then decide, okay, I'm actually going to do what I said I'm going to do. And you get into the discovery phase, the development phase, and then people just say, you know what? This is not for me. It's difficult. It's, it's unknown territory. It's time um, wasting, and I'm not going to do it. But once you start doing it, what I would say is, and I, and I came into, you know, I faced a lot of these challenges, is, is just believe in yourself and have that resolve. Things that are so simple where you expect an email to be sent from you uh, to someone else and to someone else. Something will happen. And that could, that could derail things for two months. You have to continue to just believe, to continue to call, continue to pester, and just believe in what you're doing. Um, because I feel the universe has a way of just trying to test us. And that's why a lot of people, in the end, you get resentment because these are the same people that had the same dreams as you that are more than capable of doing what you're doing or even more, but they just lacked that character to hang in there and to continue pushing or to continue fighting. So if you're an entrepreneur and you're going through those sort of challenges, just remember and believe why you set out to do what you're doing and to keep fighting and going through the trenches and you'll end up seeing the light to the end of the tunnel. I believe um, in all struggling economies, that's where the best opportunities are. Um, there are very good examples of uh, guys who are doing very well in struggling economies. Um, but people will always want to make excuses that uh, capital and so forth and so forth. Str struggling economy doesn't necessarily mean a struggling business. Yeah, a struggling economy doesn't necessarily um, uh, make struggling businesses. There are lots of guys who are making money through um, uh, industries like gas and so forth. Yeah. Thank you. 
I think we're all familiar with the word hustle, to be a hustler. I used to hate it because I grew up being called a hustler. I hated that until I became a true, I mean, an entrepreneur, and until I realized to say, I know, and I embrace it, you know, and I'll keep on pushing. One of the things is that we sort of like suffer, it's to go out there and really push it. Maybe if you don't want to be called a, you know, a hustler, then be a pusher then. Go out there and really push. How are you doing? I'm pushing, I'm kicking, I'm crawling, you know, because that's actually what business is all about. That's, that's, that's one. The second thing is that I want just maybe to touch on, um, talking to Jonathan from Zimbabwe, is that I will make an example of the media part of our business. You're talking print. The rent is very bad currently. The paper in South Africa, it's from overseas. It's paid in dollars. So everything that you think about, magazines, they're going right up. And currently magazines are not doing very well. The smart move is how do you then move with the trend? The trend is digital. How do we make sure that now we become very aggressive on the digital space and be present and make sure that the same magazine can actually be, if you go now online, you will actually find the same magazine for five rent and you just read the magazine online. How do you now move your business with the trends and say, I'm still going to be around. I am selling the Afro um, products, say, the hair products, Afro, Afro botanics. Um, maybe people are not actually, I'm not well distributed now, uh, but I'm going to now make it available online. Then I'm going to house deliver, or I'm just going to post it, or I'm going to just now target those. So it's all about just looking and identififying those opportunity, I mean, opportunities and those uh, you know, alternatives to say, if this doesn't actually work, I'm going to swiftly move with the trend. When it comes back now, print picks up, I'm going to definitely make sure that I am go back to 50,000 printing. But for now, I'm going to just cut my printing costs, but maintain you know, the presence of the magazine on the digital space. And, 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 and I don't think there is um, a better example than uh, downloading. Yeah. With iTunes and, and, and all that. It's almost put the, uh, the CVs you know, out of business. Yeah. Something you can do instantly you know, from your phone, from your, from your computer. So, yeah. <laughs> Okay, cool. Hello. <laughs> um, well, not specifically in Zimbabwe, but any any third world uh, situation. Um, my thoughts around it um, are quite simple, and it, it, it sounds uh, it's a simple solution, but it takes a, a strong mental head. Um, in countries like Zimbabwe, where you're living in a situation where everything is negative, everything around you, you watch TV, you walk in the street, you're getting a lot of negative vibes. You need to be a bit more of, um, you need to be a bit um, strong and level-headed. Um, there's something I heard last, last week or last week about one from a guy called J.T. Fox. He's a wealth coach. He said, don't complain about the economy. Create your own economy. Um, what I took from that was ignore everything else. If you're going to do something, don't sit there and say, okay, Zimbabwe is a bad place. I can't do business here. There are no opportunities. Uh, like someone said, now, now, that's where the greatest opportunities are because there is less going on. So, like, um, I'll just give a silly, silly thing like uh, perhaps Uber. There's no Uber there in Zimbabwe. So you might as well, you know, try to compete with that. Maybe you encourage Uber to come through and give some competition. There's so many things you can take, so many simple things. You don't even have to think extremely out of the box. It can be something so simple, and that's where the greatest opportunities lie. Um, I was chatting to a friend of mine in Australia, and he was saying there's no way he thinks in his current situation he can do anything great to, to you know, get out there and become an entrepreneur because everything, he feels everything is there. All the problems have been solved. But in our situation here in Africa, 
I mean, we're still like at the ground level if we compare ourselves to infrastructure and stuff in the first world. So I guess, yeah, he should just try to create his own economy, have a strong head. Can, did, yeah, okay. Yes. No. Sorry, I'm going to. Is this on? Um, to the person who asked the question about doing business in Zimbabwe, um, I think there are a number of factors, but uh, since everyone's very excited about the American election, I want to give you a quote from uh, Rubio, even though he's not doing very well. Uh, the way to turn our economy around is not by making rich people poorer, but by making poor people richer. And I think it's very important. The one thing about doing business in Zimbabwe, and I have a couple of businesses in Zimbabwe, I know. First, you have to be good at what you do. The problem is there's this myth that everyone can become an entrepreneur, which is not true, because you'll find six people doing exactly the same thing you're doing. The only way you're going to advance in a country like Zim is to be the best at what you do or to be one of the very best, because we've reached a stage where you can't afford marketing and all these traditional tools they teach you in the business school. So you're going to get your clients by word of mouth. And once you have your clients, the most essential thing is to retain them. The moment you start losing people and people saying that you provide us a shoddy service or you're not price sensitive, whatever, that is the end of your business. Because someone will go to someone else and they're not coming back. So I think that's the one piece of advice I can give you. One, be an expert at what you do. Don't try and do too many things because you're not going to make it. And make sure that you retain your clients. And most importantly is manage your costs. And uh, don't give credit. <laughs> I'm going to give you that one piece of advice. Manage your cash flows. Manage your cash flows. You can only start giving credit when you're big enough to absorb those losses. And by the sounds of it, you're not there yet. So just hold that in mind. Thanks. Um, um, you, you, sorry, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get your name. Dean, Dean. yeah, Dean, sorry, Dean. Yes. <laughs> Dean mentioned Uber. Kush, do you mind telling, um, so there's Lyft, and Lyft is just in the States right now, but it's the number two ride-sharing service behind Uber. I think Uber's worth about 40 or 50 billion, Lyft's, it's at about five to seven now. But Kush, do you mind just telling the story of how Lyft was started? Because the guy had actually come to Zim. It's a very interesting. I might, I might, okay, I might mess up the details, but um, it's a, it was an American guy from, I think San Francisco. He spent some time in Zimbabwe, and in on a gap year from school. And in Zimbabwe, what we call taxis here, everyone from Zim knows that we call them lifts. So from living in Zimbabwe and seeing that people were you know, ride sharing. He went back to the States and formed a company called Zimride. That was about seven or eight years ago and then developed the app that's now called Lyft. And that Lyft came from the fact that he, this is an American guy who lived in Zimbabwe and saw people ride sharing. Yeah. Um, raise I think that's an interesting question with how do you raise money and I think because we started our businesses at another level where there was nothing to raise <laughs> you know I started off as a model borrowing my mother's clothes and cutting them and, 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 and making them look sexier or whatever to fit into the ambience of the modeling industry um, and if I wanted I mean there's a young man that I mentored he's now a designer and he, he, he started his business by saying let me work in the fashion industry first and understand how do I connect because it's about being connected and when you raise income let's say you get a sponsor or a funder um, at times you have to get cheaper costs than everybody else and you do that through connecting through business and you have to go to 
the bottom, meaning you have to serve another entrepreneur that's higher than you to understand their business uh, systems to say this is who they connected. Oh, this is how they operate. Oh, these are their trade secrets. Yes, you walk away with their trade secrets. You cannot operate the way that they do in their way, but at least you've got a foundation. And once you've connected, you are able to then be in a place to negotiate because now people know who you are and you also understand the business from the ground level. And I think people tend to want to move from university immediately straight into opening their own businesses. And you don't understand the system of, of, of serving and sharing and understanding. And sometimes you even work and don't get paid so that you can learn the business and understand that when I go out there and I start making my money. So how do you get funding? You, I, I mean, it, it differs from country to country. In South Africa, there's the NYDA, there's Msobo Mvu, there's DTI, there's all these organizations that really are government-operated, NEF, they support. But in other African countries, you'd have to then search and say, what does my government give to a young person like me? How do they support a young person like me? And that's where it starts. And sometimes you're not young. Sometimes you're a grown person and you want to go into it. So funding, do your research. And I think any business person who doesn't do research and understand what's happening out there will never get anywhere. Right. My next question is Michelle from Tanzania. Is it a good idea to get my family involved in my business? My name is Bruce Gatsi. I'm from Zimbabwe. Um, I think the interesting thing about uh, this chat is we look, we're starting from the middle uh, end of entrepreneurship. If I go back to your introduction, you talked about your father. There was two things that I picked up. There's an element of trust with the people around him who trusted him, and there's an element of uh, relationships around I think you touched up on relationships again. The, I owned a company before of water. We broke down because of relationships as friends. But people know about Aqua Crystal was a very big business. But because of friendship, it broke down. We the Africans, we need to go. Oh, sorry, we the Africans, we need to go back to setting good examples. And kudos to you. Very few black people will work with their sons and daughters. So we can parade and preach about making it until your example with these kids is passed on to others, we are lying to each other. I'm very passionate about the little girl-child issues, but I'm very passionate about sons. If we don't build our sons like you're doing, we can preach and practice business. It won't happen. I've worked with uh, Kojo at TA Holdings and stuff, there are certain things we could have done better. But the element of trust comes in. You know, you're driving a Range Rover, but I come, I'm your senior. No, you can't do that. So it's not going to happen. So when you go back to business, the issue of trust and relationships is fundamental. The issue of support, we may look at the Indians, the white people. In Zimbabwe, the word they call Pikinini Bus is a white boy who's an average, what, five? His uh, boss is a boss. He already understands what happens in the business. The Indians, the grandmother, comes the question of, should I get my family involved? Yes, you should. If our parents sent us to school selling eggs through varsity, five, six people, they had something. But we tend to shun how our parents manage their businesses, and then we want to go to, I'm a graduate, you learn about the, uh, how many P's in marketing now? Seven, eight? Twelve now. But you know what is important in marketing? It's trust and relationships. Based on that, you're not going to sell. You know. So for us, I think as we address, we need to also go back in our businesses. Who's your partner? Who are you teaching? Who's going to follow on when you die? Or when you fall, as Coach just said, who's going to follow on? So we've got a lot more to learn, like someone said, 100 years. But it starts now. And like I say, kudos to you, your fellow business people, encourage them to work with their families. You know, if anything happens to you today, these guys will carry on. You're on radio station was there. I've listened to on radio station on there. But, you know, the buses, they were there. I've got a friend in Ninja. When you were going to school, this guy would come to school after opening the garage. We'll finish our rugby training. He'll go and close 
today is still considered by, by brand new coaches. So it's also about what we're inputting in our own. Yeah, thank you. Okay, how about family and money? Can I quickly just add on what he said? Okay. Um, one of the reasons I started trying to make money and be like as famous and as rich as possible is I, you know, when I just started out, I always wished I had more political parents, more business-like parents, more intellectual parents, because my parents really weren't. We lived like salary to salary. My biggest fear, until I learned how great my parents were, you know, but my greatest fear is that my daughter will wish one day that Beyonce was her mother. That's, my, that's a huge fear for me. I want my daughter to be like, that's my mom. Like, she's eight now, so it's still cool that I'm her mom. But when she's 16, she's still going to be saying that. It's like a great fear for me. So somehow it ties in with this whole thing of I actually need to also now, I didn't realize I have to start teaching her right now that she needs to learn about money, learn about business. I need to support even her craziest ideas. Something I learned from Thibaut Touch, actually. And um, I don't want my, parent, my daughter to wish somebody else was her mother. I, I think it's quite interesting that we are now talking about family and involving family in business. I've always, I think growing up, I just thought I'll never bring anybody into my business. Uh, but um, for the past, I think, eight years, my daughter has been working for me. She started from when she uh, got out of varsity and she started working for me. And she's running two of my biggest contracts. And she's a project manager and she's rocking it. And, you know, I remember the Department of Education coming and saying, that girl, she's a winner. She's like a mini you. And I thought, wow. You know, it's quite interesting that what you're saying, passing on the baton and saying, I want to teach and coach my kids. So every time my kids came from, came, came from, came from school holidays, I would say, you're not, you're not just going to get your pocket money. You're going to have to work for it. So when, I'm, when I was busy cooking and I'd say, cut the potato, she said, but I'm going to cut my finger. Cut the potato. Watch how we do it. And, you know, and now, now that we're running a, a huge uh, business, they are now taking over and running the projects themselves because not only are they learning from me, but they're also more qualified than I am. So they're able to take the front seat and say, I can do this better than my mother did. I was the first in, in business. Um, I come from a big family and I always believed in our, in, in girls. And um, I just said, well, I'll invite two of my um, other siblings who are actually with me now in, in the business. The other one now, she's heading the construction part, which requires like day-to-day, -day, you know, engagement and know what's actually happening. We like three, you call us three what? <laughs> Three yes, we three we three sisters now in the business, uh, with my involvement now shifting a lot from the um, from the publication to the mining and the oil space. I'm sort of like moving swiftly to that part because the focus is quite it's quite important that when you do something you've got to be much more focused. But you can't just leave you know without empowering and ensuring that they understand the business. You can't run something that you don't understand. One of the younger ones, she is actually now taking over the publishing, the printing, and the media part. And because now we really, um, I think Dumi can do it. She's, oh, yeah. she, she is. Um, so that's actually the, the whole business. As I'm here now, I don't actually have to worry about what's going to happen. And in the middle, coming back to what Pal actually said and you, uh, Sophie, about your daughter, I've got an eight-year-old. She knows that business is business. And she will tell you when she introduces herself that I am my mother's partner. She will say, I'm eight-year-old, I'm Zawi, and I am my mother's partner because I made it a point that she understands each and every little thing. I was in a meeting last night, and she says to this gentleman, oh, by the way, my mother, she's retiring from the media, and she's going to be focusing um, you know, to, into oil and mining. And I was like, did I have that conversation with you? He says, because I know, mommy, you know, so I'm your partner. So that's sort of like something that we started at the early age. And I remember very well that those are some of the principles that were instilled in me by my dad, not realizing that he's really pushing me because he was a salesperson. So he sort of like pushed me to say, you have to do it. And you've got actually to do it right. And as a firstborn child, I had that responsibility and accountability from the early age. So there's nothing wrong with ensuring that you empower your siblings. Let them be involved in the business. Let them actually sort of like understand the, hectic, the hecticness in, you know, in the business place. But 
It's a responsibility, um, you know, and you've got actually to account to the trust. It's very quite, I mean, important, and it plays a major role. And but don't just give a trust to a person that you feel very well. And I know with women, we feel it from here. If you feel that no, this is not the right sibling to really give this a responsibility to, don't just do it because it's a sibling. It's it's business. You don't want to see that thing collapsing. If you, that person is actually not meant to be an entrepreneur, because you can feel it to say there's a potential here. Let me groom this person and give that responsibility to. I was going to say that uh, the Ford Motor Company is now being run by fourth generation, I think, the CEO, right? So it it's it's been family, 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 family. Uh, in this country, we have Mr. Richard Maponya, mm -hmm. okay? And all the divisions are run by family, family, family. Mm -hmm. uh, Vice President Ramaphosa, mm -hmm. he, all, all his businesses are family, family, family. Mm -hmm. uh, Patrice Motsepe, mm -hmm. it's all family, family, family. Yes. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Sorry? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking of the other. <laughs> the other so it... I'm sure it must be right. Mm. These are all successful people. Mm. Richard Branson, I saw him the other day. His grandchild was christening the, um, the latest business venture. What is it called? They're taking people to space now. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, exactly. Bill Gates mm. and Melinda Gates, that's his wife, right? So uh, it, it must be right. If you can do it. Mm. I know a German doctor. He built a chain of nine surgeries. He had three children. A girl was a doctor. The son, son was a dentist, a doctor as well. And the other one was a pilot. At 72, he said, right. He had a family meeting. It's time for you guys to take over. They all said, no, we don't want your business. You are hardly here. You come late. And, and all the things associated with business, we are happy with our professions. He had to find a buyer. So there also has to be a willingness from 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 the other side yes thank you okay, i think we've established that finance or finding funding for a business is very important um the second area that i want to, to sort of touch on is skills mentorship um how do you get somebody to mentor you to help you um i think sophie talked about it get somebody to when you work with somebody in their business and from university and learn to do their business how important is that for our young entrepreneurs if you like it I think I grew up connecting with older people. I think I've always had this older thingy in me. So maybe with my relationship with my dad, I'm much more comfortable with slightly, you know, 10 up, you know. That's the kind of conversation that I really deal with. But I was lucky that when I came back from the UK, really now focusing because I had to make that conscious decision that I'm not going to work anymore. I really want to you know, uh, grow and develop, you know, my businesses and really be involved. And I was blessed. I don't know whether God made me choose this person or this person chose me, but I've got about three guys that are much more older and they are all chairpersons of, you know, of the big companies. Um, and they sort of like said, there is a good in you. And I said, oh, really? Um, so what do you want me to do? They said, well, we will actually mentor you. I didn't even choose, you know, to a mentor. You know, I, I, I was chosen to be mentored, and it's actually a blessing. And all these three guys that are chairperson in their big companies, they just came and said, we will chair your company. And they are chairing all in the group. We've got about four different units. You've got a construction, you've got media and publishing, you've got printing, um, you've got mining and oil. They are cheering across. We are three sisters and managed by strange people who come and check each and every little thing. We are accountable to these people who haven't actually even invested a penny, but they take care of us like they are run. They don't actually, we don't pay them any penny. They are doing that response or that contribution willing, willingness, willing fully. Willing. Willingly, yes, that's the word, willingly, um, and, and they, they, they take that ownership and they feel that they're treating us not like our children, they are children, but business people. Even if when you sort of like 
We haven't actually done the SARS, the, like now towards the end of the financial year. I know there's a board meeting coming, and we've got actually to account. So when they tell their stories of where they come from, then you immediately feel that I'm just not running a small business here. I'm running a, biz, a big business, and they always plant that in our heads that this is business. And you've, for you to be treated like to treat it like a business, you've got to think like a business person. And that mentoring really played a major role in ensuring that we do the right things. We go out there. There are systems in place. We go out there. We are accountable. We manage. We monitor. And we understand the business. And it's all about how do we also ensure that we mentor. Most of the guys that we work with, for example, in the media space, they all, from, they all graduate straight from the university, and that culture made us understand that responsibility of recruiting young women into the business that we mentor. Some they come, and some they just be picked up by different universities. For an example, if you look at one of the business studies that uh, Gibbs does, we, we give lectures in Gibbs. And give sort of like say, you've got actually to play that mentorship now. There are people that are doing MBAs. And one of the MB, I mean, one of the case study, it's Mamas and Papas case study, which is actually coming from the magazine that we do. It's offered now in gifts. And now we have that responsibility of giving back. And when I look at those three gentlemen, I said, they actually cushioned us to understand business. Now it's our responsibility to go and share that knowledge. So if you are uh, mentoring somebody, understand the responsibility and the accountability that is not just doing a favor, but you are sort of like giving or creating more jobs because you know that if my business succeeds, then I've got thousands of other people to employ. So I was in Cape Town, chilling, Long Street, having the best life, right? The beggar comes to me, ah, money, blah, 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 books. Something he was carrying some like dodgy box, and I just said to this guy, "No, this one didn't have box. This one was just coming for my money." And I said, "What are you offering me? Do you think people go around in the world giving money for free? What do you think this? What do you think this is? Do I look rich?" And then he was like, "No, my sister, man, just give me five rand." And I'm like, "No, nah, bro, not happening. What are you offering me? Do something. Do my garden." I'm like, "Okay, my garden is in Joburg. You can't do that." And also, I don't really know you like that. What's my God not going to say now when I bring you? Um, and I said to him, offer to do something. Then he's like, okay, what can I do for you? So I pulled out 50 bucks. And I said, oh, he did have books. I told him to leave his books behind. And I said, please go get me. What? I needed something from the garage. He went. No, I told him to find the money. Go buy me this thing. When you come back, I will give you 50 bucks. The thing was maybe worth 20 Obviously, he had 20 bucks somewhere in there. And he went and found the money. He bought the thing, came back. I gave him the 50. And I said, this is a lesson for you to learn that you've got to offer something of value. Find out what it is that you have inside you of value that you can offer to the next person so that you can get whatever it is you want in return. Because even if it just so happens that it's not exactly the way you want it to work. You've got to find, that's how you find the value in you and what you're good at and what you can do that you can offer to the world to make the money that you don't have currently. So if you want me to mentor you, what are you offering me in return? Is it a conversation? Is it a cup of coffee? Are you going to run around, make me tea at the office? What is it that you want? Zoro spoke about um, how you should have hope and be resilient. And everybody has spoken about how as entrepreneurs, if you're running a business, you should continue to be resilient, but I just got a question about how do you know when to let your business die? Or how do you know when to let an idea that you've pursued, you've believed in, maybe you've gotten money for it, but sometimes there's a point where you have to realize that this business is not, is not going to work. So. That's a very good one. Well, you are in business to make money. It's not philanthropy. If it has lost you money in year one, lost you money in year two, lost you money in year three. The most dangerous is inheritance. But I remember um, the chief executive of Londo, Tiny Roland, because he, he helped a lot of African people. He, one day he said, James, the biggest challenge I have is telling one of these guys when to let go. Okay? They say, oh, no, but, you know, the business bears my grandfather's name. You will be turning in his grave. So if it's not making money and it has lost you money, even if it's inheritance, I mean, you have a duty 
to your late father or your, your late mother, you know, to let it go or sell it to someone who can turn it around and still do something with it, you know, rather than close shop. But you guys are do, do this for a living. Are you still with us? Are you still with us? I would, I would like to hear your view on this. You have a business, you love it dearly, immensely, you have done everything, and it's what? It's not making money. It's, um, it's again one of those classic questions because there's no hard and fast rule to it, but the, the, the approach I would normally use is right before, when you get into the business, you decide right up front what is the amount of pain you're going to take. You know, you're going to take 2 million rands of pain, okay? Are you going to take 3 million rands? You need to make that decision right up front. But the thing is about as entrepreneurs, and you know better than, than certainly someone like, like I, is that you, you develop an instinct over time. Absolutely. You make a lot of mistakes, <laughs> but you develop yeah. a sense. And there's no one that's going to teach you that. It's your own journey. And also, we all got different pain levels. Okay? Yes. <laughs> you don't know much Exactly. <laughs> but, but the important thing is, is, is to make, make a call up front. And it's a discipline you develop. And, and certainly when you go to business schools and stuff, that's, you know, that's what they tell you. It's one of the few good things you learn in business school. Okay? You make a call up front. You say, this is how much I'm prepared to lose. It's like a relationship. Mm. He's only going to cheat on you twice or something. Absolutely. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Dite I'm involved in the media. I'm the content and programs manager at Signature Africa. And we provide content on South Africa to the UK. We provide six hours daily of content between six, I mean between five and eleven, seven days a week. So from business to entertainment, arts and So this year we're going to provide this Yes UK. we are. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, I just wanted to pose to the panel. In Africa, because this is where we are and we are discussing African entrepreneurship. How do we reconcile, I suppose, how could I say, tradition, customs, and entrepreneurship? I'll put it in context. In South Africa, we're lucky in that our legislature is for women and it's advancing them in all sorts. And then um, NEPAD has what they use the term GIRI, um, Gender Equality and Women Empowerment. How do we reconcile that for the rest of the continent where we're having issues in countries where women sometimes can't even buy land, issues of succession with your siblings? How do we make them see that you, know, you can be also a job creator or just an entrepreneur or to even foster that kind of thinking in an environment where you're perhaps told certain roles or you grow around you, there aren't any local role models besides that Beyonce that you see overseas because all the women around you aren't like that. I was just saying that because I'm even looking around today, we're discussing African entrepreneurship and there's like all of a handful of women. <laughs> With regards to um, especially the part around changing the mentality when it comes to women in the rest of Africa. Look, I come from Zimbabwe. Um, in Zimbabwe, things kind of were at one stage in that that type of culture used to um, used to dominate in Zimbabwe at one stage. But as, as time has gone on, we've actually started changing in the sense that the mentality of the younger guys has us to change, and it all starts with the, the, the younger generation. Because the older generation, it's going to be hard to ever change their opinions, their mindset. But with the younger generation, how we perceive things, how we decide to take things forward, is what actually changes that. Um, you see it with the simple things, the way our fathers and our mothers used to operate in their houses is different to the ways that we operate with our wives and with our daughters and with our children. You know, um, a question about family and including family and business. Um, back in the day with my parents, we wouldn't have our sisters being taught about the business. I grew up in a family of business people, mm -hmm. but my sister wasn't included in terms of what she's supposed to know about the business and all sorts. Um, but me, as the youngest in the family, I was taught how to, how to run a till in a shop, how to go talk to people, how to do certain things. Um, but with, with our generation now, it's become acceptable for, you know, like you were talking about how your daughter says she's your partner, mm -hmm. to uh, a man who you were having a meeting with, you know. Um, before, that wouldn't be condoned. It wouldn't mm. be accepted. Mm. The fact that she's even in that meeting mm. is not, mm. you know, it's mm. it, it, exactly. Um, mm. But nowadays, you know, a young woman is able to stand up and say, look, this is me, this is what I do. Um, and men are actually, you know, 
a good example is our panel, which is predominantly female, you know. Men stand up and they actually listen to what the women are saying. They actually understand. And, you know, in this day and age, you actually do realize that some of the better ideas in business actually do come from women. And, you know, we have to, to nurture that idea. And it starts with our generation and taking it going forward. To this whole thing about entrepreneurs and the way we box the thing, um, just take your thinking outside that. Because if you look at, I would say, the majority of entrepreneurs on our continent are actually women. And the reason I say that, look at the village structure. Look at all, where we all come from. Women are actually running the households. You have your, um, here they call them stock fells, but what do we call them in, um, in Zim, what's the word I'm looking for? Cooperatives, all of these things. People don't consider those people entrepreneurs, but really that's what it is. That is, they're going out, making money for the family and all of that. So I think people need to shift their thinking. You know, I always like to look at the example of Grameen Bank in Bangladesh. You know, they went out and they empowered all of these groups of women and they only lend money to women because they say that the women were always the group that always paid back because they realized what was needed in the home. So we need to shift our mentality because we only look at like the top 2% and we say, oh, those are the entrepreneurs that we're looking for. But actually, if you look at it, the majority of entrepreneurs in this country are actually women. The question is then, how do you go out and finance those people? How do you empower them? How do you further educate them to take them from being selling vegetables at a market mm. to putting them in the whole value chain and supplying supermarkets and whatever? So it's really a question of sh shifting our thinking. And I think that's the most important thing. Entrepreneurship is a broad topic. There's a lot to be said about it. Financing entrepreneurs, working with family, um, em empowering women, um, formalizing, I mean, the one thing that Tawanda touched on is formalizing their businesses. Because mm -hmm. it's talking about grassroots women who are running businesses, who will help them to formalize their businesses, register a proper company. Because if I'm selling tomatoes at the side of the road, I'm not going to register a company. All I know is I put in five rand and I take out 10 rand at the end of the day, and that's how I run my business. Quinta Media, um, if you would give us a few words, please. Just what a, what a great afternoon. You know, you know, time for, for us business people, we always think time, time, time. But this was an absolutely great afternoon. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate this. This is actually, a, this is all about business. We bumped on each other, typical him again, your father, Mr. Lasbon, for now, by the way, remember? Um, <laughs> And uh, Mr. Makamba just saw, and he was singing for somebody else's birthday. I think it was your birthday. Was it his birthday? No. No, it was not his. Yeah. Um, and it was my mother's birthday, and we connected, and immediately was like, what's your name? And we sort of like had a conversation, and we had, um, you know, Savita. But that kind of a typical businessman, he walked to us, interrupted us, wanting to know, what do we do? What do we do? I was actually with my sisters. Okay, three sisters and Savita, what do you do? And, you know, the relationship or the partnership started right there. It's all about identifying the opportunity right there. And he said, so what do you guys do? Out of, out of all the businesses, you also do media? I think I need to give you Agnes' number, and I didn't even know who Agnes is, and I didn't even care who Agnes is, and David. And I'm like, this guy is just getting to our space, and now I must talk to these people. I don't even know them. But here is an opportunity, you know, that he identified, and he saw an opportunity, and he grabbed it just like that, and he didn't even wait for three months. Two days later, he called. Can we do a follow-up? I'm like, he's such a pusher. God. <laughs> I haven't even Googled him yet, you know, and, but he's just all over, you know. So, so those are the kind of entrepreneurial things that we need to take with. Don't waste time. You see something, get into it. You see an opportunity, grab it now. Are you going to do something about it? And I'm grateful that Quenta Media has got now a relationship, you know, with Mark. Maybe we can probably call, you know, move Mark. Um, Makamba online and Quenta online, you know, we sort of like become yeah. a big family. No, no, we don't buy. Forget about the buying. You know, we sort of like uh, merge. merge. You know, yeah. we merge. And then I become the chair, you become. Quemaka. 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 
Imagine, you, there you go. Imagine we're in, in West Africa. Kwemaka. Kwemaka. It sounds Kwemaka. nice, yeah. eh? <laughs> so th- th- those, are, those are the small things that you might actually think, ah, oh, no, but really, will it make? But there, is a, there are great opportunities that I really see with this partnership, and I really want to thank you and the team. Um, I think, uh, yeah, within a short space of time, we haven't even, our, our relationship and partnership is not even three months old. You know, but she, we've done too many things. <laughs> Uh, just check the next uh, I- uh, issue of African Travel Market, which is coming uh, in two weeks' time. Um, it's available online if you can't, because this one we're not actually selling yet. It's for free. But go online, go to Quenta Media, uh, go to atm.net, download it. You can actually have it. Go to Essays of Africa, get the magazine online. It's only five rents. This you get in Woolworths, Pick and Pay, Spa, Checkers, um, clicks all over, and it's available for the entire continent. It's available for the entire globe. We've got huge readership in, the, in, in Nigeria, in Ghana, uh, in, in Kenya. So please, Zimbabwe and all these other countries, neighboring countries, um, just tell, tell a friend to subscribe online. It's actually available, and let them know about the cool things that are happening in Africa. This, it's our African Vogue, if you want to call it. That's actually where you see real us black women taking charge of our lifestyle and be cool and be hot and be fabulous. And same with Mamas and Papas, the magazine. It's all about integrating the African continent in terms of parenting to say, oh, by the way, we all carry nine months. There's no sort of like thing that black people carry six months and then the other racial group. You know, it's, it's an integrated uh, parenting lifestyle magazine. That's a good one. Did I say that? Um, <laughs> and then you talk about... Oh, yes, absolutely. Businessmen, if you are here and you want to be profiled, we've got a section for, uh, you know, for men. Talk, 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 talk to us. If you can't get a hold of me, talk to David. He will definitely connect you to us, and he will actually be profiled here because this, this is the future. Essays of Africa, it's the future for Africa. Now let's move to ATM. I told you about this one. You want to know the coolest place where you want to send your family and your friends? Stop going to all over this part of the world. Start by knowing our own continent. We've got so much cool places, eh? But we don't even embrace it. We want the Americans, we want um, the other Dubais to come and teach us. And we don't even know our own story. This is written from the heart by the person who is actually right here, who knows it very well. And who says, this is actually what the continent, has, the continent has to offer. And let's actually share the word. You download it online also, and it's for free. This particular one is for free. But the other ones, you get it in the relevant space. Uh, and a special thanks to Graham Beck. They are other sponsor for today. Um, they couldn't be here today, uh, but they've uh, supplied a bottle of bubbly for everyone to take home today as well. They are a Cape Town-based uh, um, winery. Um, so we're supporting African wine as well. Um, so another thing of giving back to to the continent as well. Thank you. Right. In conclusion, I'd like to thank our esteemed audience for giving us your ears and your time. Um, It's been been a wonderful afternoon. And last but not least, our panelists.